So recently I've been re-watching the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and this is the first time that I re-watched Doctor Strange as a cardiology fellow. And I was really impressed by how they depicted cardiac tamponade when Doctor Strange gets stabbed in the chest and they gotta pull out that fluid. And it was going really well until they started doing ACLS incorrectly or advanced cardiopulmonary life support. And I know this is a fictitious universe based on comic books, but the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been so done so well to seamlessly integrate all these different characters and plot lines that I think they could have changed one or two really small things to make the scenes not skip a beat. So in this video, we're gonna use Doctor Strange to review cardiac tamponade, the appropriate treatment of it, and how ACLS is really supposed to be performed, and what they get right and what they get wrong. So let's jump into the first scene after Doctor Strange already gets stabbed. <laughs> Chest cavity's clear. Uh, blood. Is it hair or heart? You got stabbed. So preceding the scene, Dr. Strange gets stabbed in the chest by a needle, and he explains right there what's going on. He has blood filling his pericardium, or the connective tissue sac that surrounds the heart. Blood. Is it hair or heart? You got stabbed. The normal anatomy of your heart is that it's surrounded by a small, thin, connective tissue sac called the pericardium. Sometimes that pericardium, that thin connective tissue layer that surrounds the heart can get inflamed and it causes a buildup of fluid surrounding the heart. That connective tissue sac can only distend so much. Now, even if you don't have pericarditis, you can still have a little bit of fluid surrounding the heart, a trace or what we call physiologic pericardial fusion. That's nothing to worry about. The issue, however, is when that fluid starts to accumulate more and more. Physiologically, the connective tissue sac can't really expand that much. So when a lot of fluid starts to build up, what actually happens is it starts compressing the heart, so the heart can't expand appropriately. The second piece of physiology that it's really important to understand is that it's not actually how much fluid, but it's how rapidly that fluid accumulates. For instance, I've seen patients who have a pericardial effusion and we end up draining over a liter and a half of fluid from the pericardium. And the reason that they were able to get that much fluid accumulate is because a little bit would accumulate over time and their body would compensate to adjust to their heart not being able to, cr to pump as much blood. Whereas Dr. Strange, he gets stabbed in the chest and has a lot of blood get into the pericardium, causing his heart not to be able to get out enough blood and cause him to go into, per into cardiac tamponade. Additionally, this is a great example of someone who needs that fluid drained immediately because it's not just how much fluid gets in there, but the fact that it got in there in a traumatic way in such a rapid manner. Clinically, for our medical trainees, we can recognize cardiac tamponade by muffled heart sounds. So when you put on your stethoscope and you listen to someone's heart, you're gonna not really hear their heart sounds as well because there's some fluid around the heart. Second thing that you'll see is distended JVD. The reason for that is that the heart's not gonna be able to pump blood as efficiently. So just like patients in heart failure, their JVD or jugular venous distension is gonna be elevated. And the third thing that's really worrisome and probably what's happening in Doctor Strange is low blood pressure. Basically, again, the heart's not able to expand, and when the heart can't expand, it's not gonna fill, and you're gonna have decreased preload. Your heart can only pump blood if blood gets back to the heart, and if you're not filling up your engine with gas, you're not gonna be able to move any blood forward. Going back to Doctor Strange and how he actually manifests and presents, before this scene, which I didn't show, he stumbles in, he looks really short of breath, which you can see. And those are some of the symptoms that you can have if you're having cardiac tamponade. You might be lightheaded, dizzy, chest pain, palpitations, your heart's gonna be racing, and you're gonna be short of breath because you're not gonna be getting enough blood to the rest of your uh, organs. And I think they do a pretty good job of showing that. But alas, the medical accuracy of cardiac tamponade in the Marvel Cinematic Universe comes to a screech and halt, at least in my opinion. You see, when he gets hooked up to the monitor, he is going at a heart rate of 40 beats per minute. If you are in clinical cardiac tamponade, you are passing out, you have a low blood pressure, you are short of breath, manifesting the fact that your heart can't beat enough blood, you should be having a fast heart rate. Just think about when you walk up a flight of stairs, what's your normal heart's response is your heart rate increases for an increased demand. That's the same thing that happens when you go into tamponade. Your heart rate is gonna go faster. Same thing happens when someone is hypotensive, if they have low blood pressure. The first manifestation of low blood pressure is actually tachycardia, and that's what you should be seeing on the monitor. Now, I don't think it's a big deal in the overall scheme of things, but I think to make it a little bit more medically accurate, they should have made them tachycardic instead of bradycardic. Let's go to the next scene. Yeah, all right. Okay. Oh, wow. 
In this one, you can see Dr. Christine Palmer getting prepared to perform a pericardiocentesis, the procedure where you put a needle into the pericardium and you drain the fluid. Now, typically when we perform it in the cardiology department or when most specialties perform this procedure, we hope to be doing it in a controlled setting and be doing it not in an emergency situation. Now, frankly, they're doing it in an emergency. He's actively dying. But it's still important to try and use ultrasound or fluoroscopy guidance, being able to use some type of imaging guidance so that we're not just sticking a needle into the pericardium and hoping that it doesn't cause any damage. The risk that is associated with this procedure is if you don't use some type of imaging guidance, you can hit the myocardium or the muscle of the heart itself, or heaven forbid, you can even nick a coronary artery. The arteries that supply the heart itself wrap kind of on the outside of the heart. So if you're just kind of putting a needle in the pericardium willy-nilly, you can go too far and nick an artery. That's kind of a dreaded complication. It's understandable that they're doing this in an emergency situation and in the emergency department, sometimes you can't find an ultrasound probe. But our hope is that we always use some type of imaging guidance. And I'm sure that that's what they were thinking when they had Dr. Strange use the astral, whatever he's doing in order to show where the blood is accumulating in his pericardium. And I like the second part of the scene where Dr. Strange is fighting that goon in the astral plane and causes Dr. Uh, Christine Palmer to kind of move while she's got that needle in his chest. No, shh. Uh, yeah, I agree with her assessment. You really gotta keep that needle very still because uh, you don't want it to be causing those complications that we talked about. Now, I think for the most part, they've done a really decent job of representing cardiac tamponade and cardiac physiology in ACLS or advanced cardiopulmonary life support resuscitation. But after this scene, it kind of goes downhill. And I'm kind of disappointed in the MCU because they do such a good job of articulating such a complex story and with Endgame and all these different Avengers movies, bringing in so many different timelines and characters into a coherent storyline. And they always have these kind of real life com comedic breaks like Dr. Nick, he goes to get a bag of chips, the astral plane dudes kick the machine, and all these extra bags of chips fall down. And I think this scene is hilarious because I know most doctors would probably go and grab those extra chips. But I think there's also a few small changes that they could have made in the scenes coming up that would have made it a little bit more medically accurate without changing much of the scene altogether. Now in this scene coming up, Dr. Strange gets a roundhouse kick to the face while he's fighting in the astral plane and he goes into asystole. Let's watch. So Dr. Strange goes into asystole where he's flatlines. That's that nice dramatic beep. And Dr. Palmer immediately goes and grabs the crash cart. She grabs the electric electricity to try and shock him. But this is my big issue with all medical TV shows and dramas is that the appropriate treatment for asystole or flatlining is CPR and a round of epinephrine every two minutes. That's it. It's not nearly as dramatic and cool as shocking someone, but that's just not the treatment for someone. That's, that would be medical malpractice if we did it in real life. So if you still want to have a nice dramatic shock in the scene and also lead into allowing Dr. Christine Palmer to help Dr. Strange later on in the scene where he gets an extra shock, this is what I would have changed. First off, after he gets a roundhouse kick to the face, on the EKG it should show VT. So that way all that Christine Palmer has to do is click synchronize and then look and see that there's VT on the screen and then you can shock him in a synchronized cardio version and boom, that's medically accurate and it's the appropriate dramatic scene that you want. And again, no major change to the plot line. All that it would change is that it would be medically accurate. And unfortunately, they also make a small mistake here. You can see before he goes uh, and gets shocked, he goes from a flat line and his rhythm comes back. You can see on the uh, right side of the screen, he starts getting that EKG and then it comes back and that's how the EKGs normally run. So, assuming that he still doesn't have a pulse and he's still passed out, we have to call this pulseless electrical activity. And again, the treatment for that is epi and CPR. All they would have to do in order to make this medically accurate, not change much of the script, no rewrites, doesn't change the cost of production, is give him VT, synchronize it, shock him. And lastly, just like how if you have VT or ventricular tachycardia, I mentioned that you want to do a synchronized cardio version. The reason for that is you want to try and shock the heart 
when the heart's natural rhythm is still causing it to beat. You don't want to give a big shock of electricity when the heart's trying to relax. That can cause VT to deteriorate into V-fib, which is an even worse rhythm. So when Christine Palmer is asked by Dr. Strange to shock him again, and she goes, no, you're already in sinus rhythm, you're back. Steven, come on. Hit me again. <gasps> Up the voltage and hit me again. What she could have done if she's acknowledging, in real life, I would never do this, but this guy's fighting someone in the astral plane, I have to help kill him. What I would have her do is again, click synchronized cardio version, charge him up, and then at least then, she's not putting Dr. Strange at risk of going into VT or VFib. And what kind of disappoints me is that I think in another movie in Endgame, we saw that they actually were able to do this higher level of thinking of what rhythm can we put Tony Stark in? And Ant-Man does exactly that. All right, move it, Stuart Little. Things are getting dicey out here. Let's I'm go. I'm not going to argue who's got the higher authority here. I'm just you promise me you won't die? You speak. We're only giving me a mild cardiac dysrhythmia. That doesn't sound mild. I need the case. I know you got a lot of pull. I'm just saying jurisdiction. Okay, then give me the case. Well, jurisdiction. Hand it over. Come on, hey. Dude, Lane. Get your hands off. Windows closing. Pull my pin. Hey, here it goes. Start. Stop. He's Medic. Medic. I think that what they do is they put him into unstable VT and VT or ventricular tachycardia can cause people to be hemodynamically unstable, be lightheaded, dizzy, have crushing chest pain, be short of breath, all those symptoms that Tony exhibit. And Thor jumps the gun a little bit. Let me try some this. Okay, I have no idea if it's gonna work. Not quite the words that you wanna hear from a person helping keep you alive, but I think Thor gets a little bit lucky here. I'm assuming that he goes into ventricular tachycardia or VT because Tony is unstable. He's not feeling very well, but he's still awake. So I think that kind of rules out V-fib. If you're in ventricular fibrillation, you're gonna be passed out. You're gonna be out. That's the rhythm that causes people who have heart attacks to kind of grab their chest when they have a heart attack and then keel over and die because they go into V-fib. So when you go into V-fib, you pass out quickly. VT, you can still be kind of awake but not feel very well like what Tony is having. And it can also be kind of snapped into it in an otherwise structurally normal heart, which I'm gonna assume Tony does have, even though he's got some shrapnel and whatever else is going on in his chest. And I think it's more likely that a quick cardioversion pops someone out of VT instead of an SVT or a supraventricular tachycardia, which if I was writing the script, I would put him into VT, but maybe Thor should take an ACLS class. I, I mean, frankly, all of them should. Comment down below if there are any other movies in the MCU that you think could use a cardiology consult. Kevin Feige, if uh, you need a new medical consultant, I am available. And I hope I pronounced your name right. And Pepperoni says, hey.